Hello and welcome to episode 262 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in Vienna, Virginia. This is Ben Olson. With me is Nathan Fox in Stateline, Nevada. I am in Ripon, California at my parents' house. I was oh, woken okay. up this morning by my nephew, Ryan, he's five, jumping mm-hmm. on me in the bed at seven o'clock in the morning. And my little cool. baby niece, Ella, and my teenage niece, Haley. <laughs> so I've had pancakes <laughs> with my mom and dad and um, they've all been doing school online, which is okay. very strange to see. Ryan was doing kindergarten on Zoom this morning. Yeah, that's rough. I think it's got to be rough for little kids because they're not meant to like sit down and. Uh, they were doing some dancing. They were wearing paper hats on their head and yelling at each <laughs> other on the Zoom. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on. Maybe yeah. they're figuring it out. Well, that's good. Yep. Hey, I just read an article this morning from my dad. Um, oh. He said that it was about how celebrities are fleeing LA. And I wrote him back yeah. and he said, yeah, Nathan fled. LA. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm <laughs> super famous. Yeah, dude, it's, it, it's, it is crazy. You know, I've been like looking to buy the, my first house. I've never, mm-hmm. I've always just rented for my whole life, but um, I've been looking to buy and the market is wild. Like, things come on the market and then they're just like sold that day. And it's, wow. yeah, like people making cash offers for way over whatever the asking price was. And it's, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of people who are taking COVID as an opportunity to, to get out of the cities. I mean, should you rent then for like a year? Like, do you think it's going to die down? Yeah. I mean, right now I've just been staying at my, my best friend lives there and has yeah, yeah. for you know so it's like no big deal for me to just crash with him for forever as long as i want but um i mean i'm ready to also have my own space yeah yeah so any anyway, yeah i but i mean dude then if i have to rent then it's like okay so i'm gonna set up another place rent for a while and then yeah. move again I, I don't know i just would like to get it sorted once and for all but well wherever you end up I'd love to come out and see it. Tahoe's great. Oh, dude, it's it is very it's lovely. Yeah, I mean it's it's really nice. There's too many people there right now. It's jammed. Like I I've never seen so many people out and about. It's like every of course it's all outdoor seating and stuff, but I mean every single restaurant is just completely jammed. Every golf course is completely jammed. Every outdoor activity, the beaches, everything is just yeah. nothing but wall to wall people. Well, up. I- Outdoor is great, period. But now it's like we've all been inside forever. It's just, it makes sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, I'm worried about it getting cold, though, in cold, you know, places where it's cold, like Tahoe. <laughs> and then <Yeah>. everybody <laughs> having to be stuck inside again. I don't know what everybody's going to do. Hopefully they're just going to leave Tahoe because there's not enough room for everybody to be <laughs> in Tahoe all the time. Um, what's on the show today? So today we are going to go over a rogue question that showed up on LawHub. LawHub is LSAC's um, repository, I guess you could say, for the their online versions of the LSAT. We have a picture from listeners, from multiple listeners. Okay. LSAT writing rundown question about LSAT writing, I guess, a pearls versus turds. Ooh, and Mackenzie's personal statement. Cool. Glad she sent it in. Um, This will air on Monday, September 7th. The deadline for the November LSAT Flex is September 23rd. So a good month and at least a week before the November LSAT. Pretty crazy. Um, And then the October LSAT Flex is October 3rd. And then the November LSAT Flex is November 7th. I, I thought that had been moved up. Maybe, but anyways. I think that is the moved up date. Oh, okay. All right. I thought it was later than that. <sighs> Email the show at help at thinking com. Send us your selfies. Leave us a review on iTunes. I haven't read those lately. Should go back and check them out. They're kind of entertaining. Um, you know, some, it's like a lot of love or hate. Okay. Well, anyways, this rogue question on Law Hub. Before we get to that, maybe uh, oh, just yeah. a quick announcement. Demon uh, is growing. Demon Live is growing. I've never had so much fun teaching the LSAT as I'm having right now teaching on Zoom. 
who would yeah. have thought that I would love it so much, but I totally do. The classes are very engaged and enthusiastic. Everybody seems to be making tons of progress. Um, it's awesome. So you should come study with us on Demon Live. You also, if you have a 99th percentile LSAT score, and especially if you are a former student of ours, Mm -hmm. You should send us an email, help at thinkinglsat.com, and tell us that you want to work with us. We're hiring for a variety of different jobs. Um, we're actually looking for teachers. Uh, I'm going to say right now we are definitely giving preference to women teachers because LSAT is too bro -y. It's too bro -y, Ben. There's too many bros in the LSAT world. You're a bro. I'm a bro. Well, I mean, we're not the bro of bros, but we are dudes, white dudes. <laughs> and for whatever reason, white dudes gravitate toward this profession and it doesn't need to be that way. It just doesn't need to be that way. So, um, Everybody send us, uh, really all we need is your LSAT score and a little note about what you're up to. Um, we're going to prefer people that are not starting law school right now. Sorry. Um, if we're going to take you on and train you, we'd like to keep you around for a little while. But uh, if you're interested in doing some part-time LSAT teaching on Zoom under our supervision, uh, yeah, just help at thinkinglsat.com. Do we need a resume? I don't like a resume. I'm no, we don't need a resume. a resume. We need a, a well-written email and then we will follow up with you if we're interested with some interviews and those interviews will involve you explaining stuff from the LSAT. So yeah, ready. if you can teach some LSAT to us, um, especially if you can, <laughs> we want to hear our voice coming out of your mouth, basically, <laughs> you know, like we've been doing this for a long time. So preferably if you studied for, with us, then you'd be a perfect fit for the demon teaching squad um yes. help at thinking cool cool um why is the lsat flex such a shit show ben have you been hearing horror stories no i i put my head down as yeah as you're we, working on the demon about... <laughs> development i'm i've been in the trenches more with the students <laughs> eric at lsac nice guy sends us these long emails telling us how great the LSAT flex is going. He's protesting too much. And the, the actual word on the street is this Proctor U continues to be just such a shit show. I can't tell you how many people have had so many problems. They have problems getting set up mm -hmm. in the first place. They have okay. problems connecting to Proctor U. They have problems mm -hmm. in the middle of the test getting interrupted by their proctors for whatever reason. The proctor's like, hey, I can't see your camera anymore. <laughs> or they shifted in their seat. So mm -hmm. when you take the test, you actually can't see a monitor of yourself. You know how, as we're doing that recording this in Zoom, you can see a little tiny picture of yourself so you can make sure that you're still centered in the frame. Yeah. But people taking the test on a laptop, especially, they go like this with their camera, you know, tilted up. And now all of a sudden, all you see is the very top of their head. Or they go yeah. like this. And now all you see is their <laughs> body. Or Thanks for the examples. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> or the lighting changes in the room. Yeah, yeah. It, all of a sudden, they're backlit. Or uh, they there can be noise distractions as well. Like if you've got, you know, like my nieces and nephew running around here, tearing everything up. If the proctor comes in and hears in the background mm. talking, then they think you might be cheating and they come in and interrupt you. When they interrupt you, the clock still keeps ticking. Mm. You're, now you're like talking to the proctor in the middle of your timed section. Um, I had, I'm sorry, but there's just, I got to say what I've heard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a student logs on, talks to her proctor. The proctor has her go into her Law Hub account and launches, wants her to launch prep test, or he launches for her prep test 73 out of her Law Hub account. So that's one of the two, one, one of the freely available, like that's in the, 
LSAC marketing thing, whatever, right? It's on Law Hub for free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Prep test 73. So she like starts doing prep test 73. What? And then she's like, wait a second. I don't think this is right because I've seen the test before. Proctor. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, keep doing it. Yeah, that's the test you're supposed to do. <laughs> what? This is, when, uh, how... this is when you shut up and just keep going. No. Oh, I guess it won't well, get submitted. Right. There's no way that was going to turn into an efficient because I mean, that's what she was thinking. She was like, this is either the best thing that ever happened to me or yeah, yeah. the worst. And mm -hmm. It's the worst, of course. So she just keeps protesting and protesting and finally gets a supervisor. Then an hour later, the supervisor comes in and goes, oh, right, no, that's not correct. Okay, here, well, let's connect you to the actual real test. Hmm. I've heard of a ton of people unable to take the test because of connection issues or whatever. Mm. Um, I've heard of people... Yeah, just are these are these proctors based uh, overseas? Do we have any sense of that? Are we? Every report I have heard makes it sound like they are not in the United States. I, I mean, yeah. why would they use Amer Americans? Would be a lot more expensive to use, presumably, than I don't know. Just curious. Yeah, just I mean, Brazilians to the or whatever. So issues. Um, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's <laughs> that would be funny wouldn't it if it was actually the proctor who was having a hard time connecting i don't i don't think that that's the issue i just think it's that people have various i mean it's i could see how it could be a hard problem for them to solve everybody has a different internet connection and you're trying to monitor but you know someone in my class last night came up with a brilliant solution for mm. half of these problems mm -hmm. she goes every class i ever took in college the test is recorded. I'm recorded mm. as I'm taking the test. Mm -hmm. And then after the test, if there are any if issues. Any problems. Right? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Because you also <laughs> mentioned earlier that the proctor sometimes comes in and yeah. hears things. So that means the proctor yeah. is not always there. So, Right. So they're, what they're doing is they're like dipping in and out anyway which makes yeah. sense that they don't need to monitor you all the time. They just need to come in and out when, when you're, you have the no risk way of knowing. Of being caught. Right. And, but now what they're doing is if they, if they hear something, they're like, wait, excuse. And they like break into your test. Yeah. And ask you to fix the noise issue or fix the camera issue or whatever. And instead it could just be flagged. They could just let you proceed, flag mm -hmm. it, review it later. And if it's, if, you know, like they could also like check to see if your score is anomalous or. For sure. They could whatever. do the regression analysis, see if something's strange. <laughs> they, and they already take not, three yeah, fucking yeah. weeks. So why not? <laughs> That's know? a brilliant idea, actually. It's a brilliant idea. Um, and if I know. I was like, problems, oh yeah. yeah. Boy, I, that would be a better way. But no, they're live. You could also it. like you wouldn't have to worry about the time that they take it, right? They're all trying to coordinate with the proctors and that's why there's certain times you right. can just say, Hey, everybody's taking it at the same time. We're recording everybody and we'll just pay people to then systematically efficiently right. go through the video, probably skipping every 10 minutes or something. I have no idea, Right. but they have some random algorithm and they go check and they're like, yep, these all look good. You could even probably automate it. You're just like, right. was there something in the background? Was there not? Was there sound? Was there right. not? And then instead of the obviously person. haphazard way in which they're doing it, um, yeah. you know that also everybody's not getting the same test now. Yeah, I'd heard rumors about that, but I didn't know what to make of these rumors because they've been around for years, you know, yeah. before the LSAT flex. So, yeah, well, right. The, if, uh, accommodated students taking the test on a different day uh yeah. there, there have been some situations where people aren't getting the same exact test but now with the flex it's clear that everybody is getting a different there, there are like four or whatever different versions of the tests and what yeah. i've heard so far is that like yeah oh yeah there's one of the sections of games out there that's like super duper easy and then there's other ones that are harder and <laughs> so I agree. I think, you know, they think they're doing the best they can. Um, they could just do better. They know. could do better.
And you know, what's interesting is your student made that recommendation, for example, about recording. And it's like, oh, well, we, we should get that information to them. They're the ones who have been sitting on this for a long time. They should have been talking to people and exploring these ideas long before your student thought of it. I mean, <laughs> well, as much as I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry you didn't think about that idea. At the same time, it's like, yeah, this is your job and you've been toying with this. Um, I'm surprised you hadn't heard someone suggest that. No, and this is a student who actually took college exams using Proctor U before the Flex even existed. Mm -hmm. So it's like Proctor U has this capability and does mm -hmm. Proctor some exams in this wow. method. So someone but made this decision. They were presented like with it, these yeah. two choices and I they said, okay, so. let's go with the human solution, which then would require multiple tests because they have to spread the tests out and would require them to go to a three section test because now they don't have the bandwidth. And I would presume sections. it's more expensive to do. So it's, it kind of sounds like Dr. <laughs> U might've sold them the most expensive option and they went with that. I, whatever. We're purely speculating. There's gotta be lots more going on that we don't understand, but. Um, That's true, but this has been, also a problem throughout LSAC's history, right? We've been scratching our heads for so many decisions that they've made yeah. over and over and over again. Remember in 1999 when we had that episode about them exploring a digital version of the LSAT? That was in 1999. 2009. 1999. <laughs> I'm pretty sure about that. I'm pretty well, sure about that. I didn't take the LSAT until 2007, so I don't think it was in 1999. I don't, I don't understand like how when you took the LSAT is relevant. Remember, we found that that um, newsletter. Oh, and they said that they had I thought raised you said, the. My bad. Yeah, I thought you ahead. said an episode that we did in 1999. Oh. Like, the podcast did not exist in 1999. <laughs> no. I was, was I wearing diapers then? I don't remember. It was 1999. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, no. There, there was a newsletter that we got that was from LSAC. It was like to their board members or something like that. And in it, it had discussed how in 1999, they had raised this issue oh, of whether or not to go I digital see. with the LSAC and then shut it down. <laughs> It's like they've had so many opportunities to do things right and not done them right. Hey, the GRE and the GMAT give you your scores instantly, and they have for decades. Yeah. That's a fact, right? That's a fact. <laughs> I mean, the LSAT, you have to sign up six weeks in advance to take a super fucked up broken test and then hopefully, if they don't lose it, then wait three, three weeks. weeks later, you get your score. Yeah. What year is it? I mean, I get it that COVID, you know, made them hastily. I mean, it's actually, you know, the flex, they, they weren't doing it online until COVID. Now they're doing it online because of COVID. I mean, it's not GRE and GMAT are not online either, right? G they are in the, these testing centers where professionals handle the administration of the test it's dude it's really horrible i mean it's so miserable for the customers right for the for the students for the applicants mm -hmm. waiting three weeks to get your score back sucks yeah. i remember when i had to wait for my score it totally totally sucked yeah i remember i actually got my score in the mail that was <laughs> I mean, that's just weird too. And the whole, like they gave me the whole test because it was a disclosed test, right? So it's like, here's this like. In the actual paper. physical mail? Yeah, wow. in the mail. It was like a, you know, an eight and a half by 11 envelope or whatever. Nine. That was 12. a few years, I guess, before I took mine. Mine definitely, I got it. I got an email and I logged on to a thing and that was in 2007. I yeah. still, I still remember the street. I was in my car when I opened the envelope and it was yeah it's interesting i was very curious what the hell is my score what did i get <laughs> weeks later um yeah well and and now 
they're basically forcing you if you want to go to school this cycle and if you want to get your application in early you know now they're like forcing applicants to take multiple overlapping tests because you have the registration deadline is so far in advance and the scores don't come out until so far after the test that now if you're waiting for your August results, you already should be signed up for the October test. And if you're going to take the October test, then you should also have to sign up for November because the windows overlap. And it's like, come on guys, how hard is it? It just, it can't, it can't. I, whatever, but maybe it's a bigger problem than I think it is, but I, I got to think that we can solve that problem. I, I, does doesn't seem that tough especially when you consider the amount of money they're throwing at it like a lot of decisions are hampered by finances right but the money that they have to throw at this is insane especially yeah. the money they poured into to surface goes and all that it's got a hundred uh, over a hundred thousand tests administered per year at two hundred dollars a pop i mean i guess mm -hmm. there's like six percent of them or whatever that get the fee waiver but most people pay $200 every single time they take this test. 100,000 times $200 is $20 million of revenue just from the tests. For That's $20 not million. Dollars. The CAS and all the other fees that they charge for random stuff. So, and the royalties that they've been getting for years and the royalties that they're now getting through Prep Plus. Where is all that money going? I don't know. And they where got the a PPP money... loan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It it just it doesn't seem like a totally intractable problem. This seems like something that they could have that they could solve somehow. Uh, in there multiple other solutions besides what they're doing right now. But again, it's a monopoly. Um, people don't have a choice. Uh, and it's an organization run by a bunch of lawyers, so they tend to move extremely slowly. They're worried about getting sued or whatever, I guess, but they just, I don't know. It, the, the, I just feel so bad. I'm like looking at my class and I'm like, God, sorry guys, this is, I feel you, man. I don't know what to tell you. It's just awful. Yeah, uh, last ask night, all the time, should I sign up for this test? And I'm like, Sign up for it. You got to pay the 200 bucks to have the option to take it because you won't know for a month yeah. whether you should. I mean, and last night in class, you know, because it's such a shit show, people like they're still in class after they've already taken the official test because they're not sure how it went and because law schools only care about your highest score. And so most people benefit from taking it multiple times. But like of the people that are there in the Zoom last night, of the people who already took it, like half of them had some kind of a glitch where mm -hmm. it took them an hour just to get connected to the proctor. And so they're, so they were like hungry by the time the test started, you know, <laughs> or they got interrupted because there was some background noise and the proctor broke in during their section and they had two, three minutes to talk to the proctor and like confirm that. Um, what did someone say? Oh, the proctor, instead of talking to them, the proctor just took control of their mouse and started moving the mouse around the screen to try cool. to get their attention, basically. Like, I don't know if the proctor <laughs> was also sending them a text message or something, but the student looked up and all of a sudden the mouse was moving around on their screen. And I think what it was is they, they were, they apparently looked as if they weren't looking at the camera. And so the proctor did this. And so then they it, it like got their attention or whatever. I don't know. I mean, I'm just hearing so many of these weird stories and <laughs> I don't know. All right. Should we uh, move on to our actual agenda? Yeah. Here, I'll go ahead and read this email because I Do actually it. wrote it. I didn't realize this was for me until just now. But anyways, oh, right. I, so some, we got some error notifications from Demon users. They said, hey, what's up? Uh, I just took test 86 and um, you're missing a question 
from the reading comp past from the reading comp section and we're like okay. we are like what oh fuck okay let's go get this fixed and their reason for thinking that we were missing a question was because in law hub test 86 reading comp section had 27 questions and the demon had 26 questions so uh -huh. i quickly went to the official lsat pdf for test 86 that we've been using for over a decade and it only had 26 questions. So I reached out to LSAC, right? This created some confusion at first, like what the heck? And I said, hey, we noticed that test 86 on Law Hub has 27 questions and the test itself has 100 questions, but the official PDF has only 99 questions for the test and only 26 questions in the reading comp section. What's going on? And which one is right basically, right? And we got this email back. Hey, Ben, I'm looking into this. I will let you know when I get word from our team. Hey, Ben, I had to follow up like a week and then a, later and then again. <laughs> There's a lot going on at LSEC, I guess. But anyways, hey, Ben, sorry for the slow reply. The PDF is correct. And our team is working on correcting Law Hub. So if you took test 86 in Law Hub, you got 100 questions, which means you got this mystery question, which I, I don't know. I still don't really understand what happened. What was it like on the official test and was removed and they never told anyone because it was the last question in the section. So they didn't have to say item removed from scoring. Oh, it was question number 27. I see. Yeah, yeah. it was the last question or um, I don't know, like where did they dig that up and whoever did dig it up, added it to the overall test calculation, right? Out of a hundred questions. So anyways, so we were getting daemon user errors about an error on LSAC law hub. Yeah. It's like a so, virus. Their their errors <laughs> are <laughs> like infecting the rest of the network. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad we turned out to be right. Order has been restored, but I was curious about that question. I haven't looked at the question yet. Have you? No. Uh, we're going to do that passage uh, in one of my classes pretty soon on live. And uh, it'll be interesting to go through that question with the class and see. I mean, it's not an official question, but it'll be, it'll be interesting to play with it anyway, just to see what it looks like. Yeah. Maybe it's an item removed from scoring. I don't know. They did, so they didn't even explain that either, right? No, nope. they're just like, hey, the PDF is correct. We'll fix it and I'll unlock it. No explanation. We don't, don't know if it appeared on the actual test. Don't know if it's just a random, someone was like, oh, this section needs another question. We'll just start making well, it. Well, I did read the question and it did seem on point. So it was related to the passage. Well, yeah, not like totally separate. But did you like actually try to answer the question? Did no, it... I didn't try to answer it. Yeah. I just, I just saw that it was talking about the same topics. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna I, read the passage yeah. and try to answer the question and see if I get it right. If I get it right, then you know it's perfect. If I get it wrong, then it's clearly an error. That's why it was removed from scoring. Wait, yeah. but does the answer key even have an answer? It doesn't. We, yeah, we did. We got it from Law Hub. Oh, on Law Hub, it actually had an answer yeah. for question number 27 yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can see what the purported correct answer is. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have no idea what this next thing is. It says, my dog doesn't have what it takes to be a lawyer if she can't get through introducing the LSAT Samuel. And it's a picture of a very cute dog taking a nap with one of my books. Eyes open. Ew. You're right. The, with the tongue out <laughs> and the eye, the dog is doing the creepy rigor mortis looking eye open while sleeping. Okay. Yeah, that's Maybe a, that's an interesting picture. My book well, killed the dog. I don't know. Oh, I guess dear. that'll... Maybe that'll be the picture for this week's show on the... It has to be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Samuel, for sending that in. We appreciate uh, we appreciate all the photos that our listeners send us. That's very helpful. Um, yeah, here's, yeah, thanks. So here's the next one is LSAT writing rundown. I'll, I guess I'll read this. This is from oh. Shelby. Thanks, Shelby. Um, hello, Ben and Nathan. 
I just got my writing approved and I wanted to give you guys an update on the process. My writing approved? I'll start writing. Maybe you have to get it approved. I don't understand. I felt like it didn't, I didn't have clear information going into it. Hopefully this information is useful. Number one, there is no longer a $15 fee to take it. It is included with the cost of the LSAT. According to LSAC, the LSAC website, there is also no longer the option to take it on its own. Wait, what? Uh, you have to, because they decoupled it, right? It, for When they first announced online LSAT writing, it was, mm -hmm. okay, LSAT writing is no longer a part of your testing day. It's an online thing that you have to do one time. It costs $15. That was a year ago? Yeah. Maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when apparently, the, uh, mm -hmm. they recoupled it or they just got rid of the $15 fee. They have plenty of other fees. They got rid of that I fee. I don't know what this means. Though. No longer the option to take it on its own. Like you that means you can't just it. sign up for LSAT writing. You have to sign up for an actual LSAT, and then that triggers your... LSAT okay. writing, but, but I guess it won't ha happen if you've previously taken it or does that mean now it automatically happens? Like you have to do it <laughs> every time. Okay. okay. <laughs> <Number two. laughs> when I first tried to do it, my link didn't work. Surprise, surprise. I tried calling the tech support line, but it rang busy. After several attempts and 35 minutes on hold, how convenient it was 35 minutes, I was told my link was bad and that someone from LSAC would contact me with 20, within 24 to 48 hours. No one contacted me, so I called LSAC and they fixed the issue. <laughs> All right, number three, when you click Nothing on the Nothing gets launch, me more than bad customer service, man. I. I hope all of our listeners and demon subscribers and stuff, I ask the class regularly. I'm like, hey, how, how quick are they getting those ask button responses back to you? And I expect them to be like 24 hours. I, like, I just, I want, if you email help at lsatdemon.com, if you have any issues with your demon account, you should expect that we're going to get back to you like immediately. That's how we do business. I have no patience for people who can't figure this out. I just don't get it. Like I get COVID, whatever. Hire extra help, man. Get back to your customers. What are you doing? Yeah. Are you, not, are you, or are you not in business? It, I, I just don't understand. So really you, they, they told you that they would get back to you within 24 to 48 hours and then just didn't get back to you at all. So you had to call them again. That's not good for anybody, including them. Yeah. It, it takes twice as long for them to do it that way instead of just helping you. And God damn it. All right. Number three, when you click on the launch LSAT writing link, you will be given the option to click the link that says LSAT writing FAQ or the button that says yes, launch LSAT writing. You must click on the FAQ link first and will be prompted to download the software. <laughs> of course, because that makes sense. Yeah. You start by clicking frequently asked questions. That's how, <laughs> clearly how everything starts. I, I wonder if this, this is for real. Once you've downloaded the software, it will take you through the whole process of checking in cameras, camera scan, the opportunity, camera scan, the opportunity to familiarize yourself with the interface. I don't know. Oh, maybe there's a missing comma. Shelby's just I, doing a kind of a stream of consciousness style writing here that's popular with the kids these days. Just, yeah, just go with it. Because I'd gone through the whole process of taking pictures of my ID and stuff, I didn't realize this was a test run. So when I hit the end exam button, which you have to do to get out of it and into the real thing, I thought I fucked myself. <laughs> but it was actually just a practice run to click through all the things before the real thing. Yeah. Okay. Number four, once you've hit the end exam on the practice interface and been told this will submit the exam, you can go back into LSAC, hit launch the exam, and then hit yes to proceed to exam and do it all again for real this time. <laughs> oh, man. That's, yeah, that's a 
poorly thought out system, <laughs> as is the organization uh, called LSAC. Okay. Um, <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thanks for the 17 LSAT point increase already. Holy smokes. That's awesome. We'll see if I can make it 20 this weekend, exclamation point. I hope you do. That is incredible. Best, Shelby. All I ever hear from demon users is like, hey, have you ever taken an exam on Law Hub? And I'm like, no. They're like, that interface is terrible. And it's the exact interface for the real test. <laughs> it's the exact same thing. And it's a, just a terrible interface. The demon is so much better. I'm like, oh, sorry. I don't know. Maybe we should make it worse, Ben, so that it like more accurately reflects the experience that students are going to have on the official test it's no surprise bad, that the I have bad writing... news for you it's getting better so <laughs> yeah, i know i know you're working hard on it um yeah it, i i'm not surprised in the slightest that lsat writing is also a similar proctor u shit show um that's great there i'm guessing shelby that there is some other way around this uh system i i do know and we were talking about this in class last night as well you mm. can log on to proctor you in advance and go through all the camera check and all that stuff there's like automated systems that check mm. like your setup um mm -hmm. the problem is your setup can change like if you're on a laptop or if you shift around in your seat or if the lighting changes in your room or if the background noise changes and so those automated checks don't you know, they can just make sure that you have access, like that Proctor U has access to your camera and shit like that. But you yeah. can't replicate the effect of the real live proctoring. Um, <clears throat> we've made an, uh, in response, um, our proctored tests now, our proctors are encouraging the students to leave their cameras on. And mm. our proctors are actually giving students feedback about what they see on the camera uh, during the proctored sections. So like if you come to one of our Saturday practice tests, which are included for Demon Live and premium subscribers, <clears throat> you can sit for a, a proctored LSAT flex, leave your camera on, and then whoever that proctor is, if something weird happens, if there are distractions, if there are um, you know, camera changes, if it looks like you're not paying attention, the proctor um, will send you a note after the test to mm. tell you. <laughs> so that's as close as we can get to replicating the real. <laughs> Maybe we should also have a FAQ that you have to click through in advance. It's super <laughs> confusing, like end test now. And you have to click that button, <laughs> and then, you know, then to get, it's like, I love this idea that there's two buttons on the screen when you first log in, one of them says FAQ and the other one says launch LSAT writing. And the correct button is not launch LSAT writing. That one doesn't work. You have to click FAQ, click through a fake version of the test, get all the way to end submit, <laughs> which is super scary. No one's going to want to click that button. So someone designed that and literally set, thought, well, everybody's going to have questions. Really? No, people want to get this stuff done. <laughs> well, <laughs> I thought you were going to say someone also designed that process. And at the end of it, they looked at it and they were like, chef's kiss. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. this is perfect. <laughs> I have d magnifique. I have perfectly done, you know. <laughs> This makes total sense that people are going to have to click through an entire fake version of LSAT writing, including clicking the submit button, end exam, submit, and then get to the real. I mean, someone was like, yeah, totally. That's, that's how, that makes sense. That's how yeah. this should work. <laughs> All right. Thanks Shelby for writing in. Hopefully they'll fix that process. Um, in their defense, they do seem to be working on this stuff constantly and trying to make it better. Um, they're just not actually making it better. Pearls versus turds time. This is the feature of the show where we take a bit of received LSAT wisdom from the internet and we tell you whether it's a pearl or a turd. Um, yeah. Leaderboard update. So far in the history of the show, there have been eight pearls, 35 turds, and 18 ties, which let's be honest, are more turds than pearls. Um, point of this is there's a lot of really bad LSAT advice out there. I hear bad LSAT advice every single day, every single class, somebody asks me a question about some tip they heard and they're all bad. 
Um, By the way, this reminds me of uh, the personal statement workshop that we did. And if you missed that and you're a demon subscriber, check it out in the lessons. But um, when we got to that one personal statement, I think it was by LL or LM or whoever, right? And it was yeah. like terrible. And you said at some point, you're like, this, this one isn't actually horrible or something like that. And the chat blew up with people say, that's, that's awesome. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> nice work, LM. <laughs> this isn't total dog shit. So uh, <laughs> that was the nicest thing Nathan's ever said about somebody's personal statement. Um, yeah, there's bad tips. You want to hear a bad tip I heard from class last night? Yep. So my man, Michael, I love this dude. He's been in class now for a couple months. He's, he's very interactive. He's just a super smart guy, and, but he's got some kind of crazy ideas. And this idea was when guessing, Michael always guesses A. And I'm like, I don't care what letter you guess. Just pick the same letter. I don't give a shit. Just don't, just quickly all the same letter. Yeah, yeah. Michael was like in the chat, he's like, oh, well, I always guess A because mm. when I go back to do the question, right? Because I'm going to do all my guesses and then I'm going to go back and do the question. But when I go back to do the question, because A is the first answer, it's slightly faster for me to read what? it and eliminate it. And I'm like, come on, bro. That's only going to help you on one question max, right? Like that's only going to help you on the very last question that you're able to do before time runs out. And even then it's only going to help you by like five seconds. So like, I'm like, dude, that tip is worth at most, I think I said one tenth of one point, but I would like to revise that down to more like a one, one hundredth of one point or something like that. And there are a lot of those tips out, out there where it's like, well, theoretically, like mathematically speaking, sure, it might be worth something, but it's still a turn I, because I, there's no. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say that I, I actually think um, consistently picking the same answer could be valuable for someone for a totally different reason. And that being that when. <sighs> I, I don't know when you start, even this is like so marginal, but um, when you start answering the questions that, you know, in those last five minutes, yeah, it's like kind of confirming to you that you're in that guessing state, right? It's not one that you've attempted at some point or it's oh, less yeah. likely to be. But I, I hear that. I just yeah. don't care whether it's always A, always B, always C, doesn't always matter. D, or always E. It literally doesn't matter. I've always it's, been on Team it's D. All, it's also good because then at least that decision is made, right? So it's like you get the five minute warning. Okay, I'm gonna go do all A's, and you're not we're not wasting any time thinking about anything. Yeah, um, I agree. I pick your favorite letter. I don't give a shit which one and what it is. But like this analysis of like, well, it's faster to get you know if, if when I and it, but it. So I, what I actually had to say to Michael was, dude, that actually could be hurting you because now because this theory shows that you're thinking about it all wrong. In the last five minutes, mm -hmm. you should guess on every question that's remaining, and then you should yep. do one more question accurately. And then if you have time, you should do one more question accurately. But that's mm -hmm. clearly not what he was thinking. What he was thinking was, oh, no, I'm going to like rush through all six of my guesses. And if, if I had picked A, then I'll be able to more quickly eliminate it. And it's like, dude, what are you telling me? That you're not even reading all the answers for those questions i mean it just <laughs> it made no sense so okay <clears throat> here's the actual pearl versus turd that's on yep. our agenda hi i recently watched a consulting video in it the company offers a tip to lsat takers narrow the goal posts that is try to complete sections a few minutes faster than necessary during practice tests this one's been out there for a while. Yeah. This one is an old school turd. It's a, um, I was going to say desiccated, but the word I was actually looking for was petrified. It's a petrified turd. Mm. His reasoning is that like how football kickers narrow the goalposts during practice, 
giving yourself less time on PTs will make the actual test seem easier, given that the conditions are more favorable. Pearl mm -hmm. or turd, thanks, anonymous. Um, you know, it's not just football kickers. Um, I'm a golfer, mm. and some golf courses on the practice green, they will have a cup that instead of the normal size of a cup, which is, you mm. know, four inches or whatever, they'll have yeah. a cup that's like half that size, like a little tiny baby cup, two inches. Mm. The idea being, hey, practice on this like super small target. And then when you get out there on the golf course, it'll feel like you're putting into a coffee can, you know, just... <laughs> um, I think there, yeah. there are basketball hoops that are smaller that people practice on. Um, there's got to be all kinds of other uh, running, like running uphill with weights, right? So that mm -hmm. on the actual race, you feel like Superman. So the analogy makes sense, but is it apt? It does not apply. When you are practicing for the LSAT, we tell people to do the exact opposite. If anything, we're saying expand the goalposts <laughs> and don't think about the time. Get 100% correct on the ones you get to, and then we know you can get to the next question eventually. Yeah. If, if you, this, all this tip is doing is encouraging people to think about the time too much and to race the clock and skim the surface and not really understand what you're doing. I, I don't, I don't care that you're able to finish the section in 31 minutes. I mean, your accuracy probably suffered as a result. Um, maybe here's a more apt analogy bringing up golf and in this case football, but um, I remember when I was in college, there were these like, golfing applications that came out where you'd put like these you know you attach like um electronic equipment essentially to your like arms and then you'd swing and it would track your swing and then it would tell you all this stuff about your swing right i'm sure that's all been perfected by now but it was kind of new at the time i think uh but the bottom line was you went slower on your swing right you're like trying to get your swing right and then you're going faster. They do all that shit with cameras now instead of stuff that's attached to your body. You know, it's like cameras and yeah. lasers and, and that type of stuff. But um, yeah, the, I hate this tip. Uh, this is, all this does is it encourages people to do the exact opposite of what we want them to do. I, I do want you to time yourself on your practice, but I want you to basically ignore the clock. And if you're timing yourself, I want you to use the actual time that you're going to have on the day of the test. Um, certainly not less than and try to race the clock. Um, this is encouraging people to, to game it and to try to half ass it and to not really understand. I, I mean, the way you score really high on this test is you actually understand each question you solve each question not skim it and guess not not even half guess but figure out the correct answer because the correct answers make perfect sense and that takes how long it takes and you can score in the 90th percentile 165 right is roughly the 90th percentile mm -hmm. you can score yeah. 165 by only doing 90% of the questions easily, mm -hmm. easily. It's not, it's not even difficult to, to, to beat nine out of 10 other test takers. All you got to do is get like the first 20 in each section, right? That's only 80% of the questions. If you get the first yeah. 20 right in each section, you're in the 90th percentile. Yep. So this narrowing the goalposts idea is just terrible. So that's another turd. Um, you ready to read this next email? Yeah. Hey, Ben. I wanted to say a big thank you for all your help with the LSAT. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Heading into this process, my goal was to get into the evening program at Georgetown. My first practice test, my first practice LSAT score 150 was not enough to make that happen. As you might remember, I ended up getting a 169 and a 168 on my two official tests. Yeah, that's totally different applicant. 
Thanks in large part to my LSAT score, I got into the evening program and received $20,000 a year in merit aid. This, plus working full time, should allow me to graduate without too much student loan debt. I'm excited about this outcome. Um, I'm glad you got some money. Would have been nice to get more, but. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the part time program costs less, right? I, I don't know what the mm -hmm. part time program costs. So, 20 grand, if, if that was in the full time program, would actually be pretty shitty. 20,000 in the part-time program might be better depending on what Georgetown part-time actually costs. It's still probably 40 grand though, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I'll look it I up. Can you honest, can keep reading. You know, what's interesting is we had this question actually before, can you even get money for the part-time program? Well, yes, you can. Indeed. Yep. I can honestly say that you made this whole LSAT experience enjoyable, at least for a standardized test. I enjoyed getting to know you a little bit and hope your path, our paths cross in the future. Ah, yeah, likewise. Maybe I'll start CrossFit once I graduate. <laughs> I'm not doing CrossFit anymore, so. Uh, thanks again, grateful former student. P.S., as students will be hearing back from schools and considering their offers, I could emphasize how important it is to ask for aid. I didn't get any assistance from Georgetown up front, but I sent an email asking if there were, was merit aid available and ended up with 80,000 in total. I only knew to do that because you told us in class. Thank you. Exclamation point, exclamation point. Wow. 80 grand email, right? It's actually more than that because you consider all the interest you would pay on that. It's a hundred thousand dollar email at least. Yeah. No, the, their starting offer was zero. Their starting offer yeah. was we would love to bless you with admission to our glorious <laughs> institution. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, and no, no mention of money. Um, the annoyingly they on their 509 Georgetown lists uh, per semester for full time, which mm. by the way is 32 grand. So 64 grand a year to go to Georgetown for three years. Mm. Yeah. 200 grand total. Um, on the part-time program, it lists it per credit, which <laughs> might be, I mean, that might be because they don't force people to do it in four years. Maybe that's like more mm. of a flexible program where you could do it in three and a half or you could do it in five or whatever. And so they list it per credit, but I think we can still calculate it. I bet it's going to work out to be exactly the same amount. Um, 20. So it's, I got 2305 here. Mm -hmm. um, credits, normally it would be 14, let's say, credits per semester times six. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see if this adds up. So 2305 times 14 times six equals, yeah, almost 200 grand total. Okay. The two programs are going to cost the same, right? Total. Yeah. Roughly. So if you're doing this in four years, um, which most part-time people plan to do in four years, we're looking at 48 grand a year. I, I mean, I'm assuming um, our correspondent here, and I'm, I'm sorry, I lost the name, um, grateful former student, GFS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. GFS uh is getting 20,000 a year. I would presume that's for four years. Yeah. And I think that's how we got the 80 grand. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it does say 80 grand. Okay. So 20 grand a year. For, so this is actually less than a 50% scholarship. Mm. Um, the 75th percentile grant amount in the part-time program is only 15,000. So that looks like a better than average, uh, grant in the Georgetown yeah. part-time program. Yeah. Um, it's better than zero. It's better than zero. It's better than yeah. most other people at the school are getting. Yeah. Um, okie doke. Cool. Um, ready for this personal statement? Thanks for yeah. writing in by the way. Yeah. GFS. Thanks GFS. Great to hear. Yeah. It we'll is great to hear. Yet another 20 point improvement um, on the LSAT or almost 20 point improvement from their first yeah. diagnostic. So it's a extremely learnable test. If anybody ever tells you anything different, they do not know what they're talking about. Yeah. 
Okay, Mackenzie is brave. This is very short. This is three paragraphs. Wow. Interesting. Maybe she's listened to us. <laughs> Most people go the other route on that. Although these are pretty long paragraphs. I think if I turned this into a uh, double space, they're going to look really, really long. Anyway, hi, Ben, Nathan, and Annalisa. That's our producer, A. Dot. I would like to submit my personal statement for critiquing on the show. I have listened to all of the podcast episodes with good personal statement examples and attended the workshop on Tuesday. So I think I'm at least not making the most obvious mistakes. That's the curse of death when people say. Like <laughs> I'm doing well. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're right, McKenzie. Yeah. What I struggle with most is the content. The things that I mentioned in my personal statement are pretty much the most impressive things I've done in the last year and a half. I just graduated from college in May and I haven't had some badass job where I fixed some major problem like many of the statements you all read on the show. I do have a 4.0 GPA and have been scoring in the upper 160s, mid 170s on practice tests. I take the test next week. So at least I have that going for me, LOL. Thank you all for your help. Best, Mackenzie. Hey, Ben, hmm. what would you rather have? A 4.0 and a 170 or a good personal statement? Oh, <laughs> a 4.0 and a 170, hands down. <laughs> yeah. If you had the world's worst personal statement, you still wouldn't get in. But if you have a 4.0 and a 170 and an okay personal statement, you're probably fine. I would much rather have that than the world's best personal statement, a 3.0 and a 150. Yeah. In that case, they're not even reading that shit at top schools. So, well, the thing is, you're definitely going to get in somewhere. Someone is willing to plug their nose and take you to. Dude, pretty much everyone is getting in somewhere. Yeah. Since half the law schools shouldn't even exist, right? I mean, since half of the people who go to law school don't practice law. There are plenty of schools out there that are willing to take all your money and do absolutely nothing for you. The point is not to get in. The point is to get into a good school and go for free. Yeah. Um, with a 4.0 and a 170, <laughs> there are tons of schools that are going to offer McKenzie a full ride, even with a bad personal statement. So. Hey, I wanted to talk a little bit about this comment here. She says, the things I mentioned in my personal statement are pretty much the most, quote, impressive things Air I've done quote, in, the last impressive, yeah. uh -huh. in the last year and a half. And I hear this a lot, right? Like we talk to people about their personal statements in these workshops or whatever, and they're like, hey, I don't really have anything to write about. I haven't done anything amazing. Um, and I sympathize with them in, in the sense that you have a, a kind of a boring job and you haven't done that much at your job except do whatever your boring job is. But I was just thinking in this moment as I was reading this and I'm like, instead of acting like, well, this sucks. This is my lot in life. I haven't done anything amazing like what Matt did in his personal statement or this other person did in their personal statement. Maybe you need to be more proactive. Either one, seek out more opportunities at work, right? You're doing your job as they've asked you to do it. But maybe you need to be more aggressive and more like that person who's at the job and saying, hey, I, I see you guys are doing this other project. Can I get on that project? I know it's not in my job, but like be proactive. And two, if you can't do that at your job, maybe you should be looking for a different job, right? Like instead of passively just saying, oh, nothing's ever happened in my life and I don't have these opportunities, why aren't, maybe you should be looking for them. I think that that's why Matt was at the job he was at. And that's why he got the job that he got. He took yeah. over the manager position because he was seeking those opportunities. He could have just sat there and been like, oh, they suck. Why can't they do that? I'll second that advice generally is that just everybody should quit their job. I mean, not the people that work for us because they're <laughs> awesome and we need them. But other people who don't work for us should for sure quit their jobs because if you don't like your job, there's a million other things you could do and just go try something else. I mean, I ended up being happier than anybody in my career and that's because I sucked at and quit and hated and quit 
nine other things before I luckily found, you know, fell into LSAT teaching and found the right fit for me. It really is about fit. And so, yeah, if you if you don't feel like you're doing useful, cool things that you want to brag about, well, then just quit that stupid job and go find something else. It's a world of opportunity out there. Well, and also if you're risk averse, there's no harm in doing your job every day and start looking. Moonlight, Just start well, looking. Hey. Yeah. And moonlight. I moonlighted as a GMAT teacher. I had a job, a day job that I hated so much. And I started moonlighting as a GMAT teacher just like because I was bored and I thought I'd pick up some extra cash. And I accidentally fell in love. I never thought I, I, I thought I would hate being a teacher. I'm like super yeah. afraid of public speaking generally. You know, if you asked me to make a toast at a wedding or whatever, I'd be like shitting myself. And I didn't yeah. think I was like a public speaker like that. I didn't, I, you know, I started teaching GMAT classes with like three students in the room and I was able to get my feet under me and realize that I loved it. And, mm. you know, but that was because I was going outside. So, I mean, and maybe that's the tip, huh? Like you, you could, you could look or you could mm -hmm. actually start doing part-time stuff. Mm -hmm. By the way, email help at thinkinglset.com if you would like to work with us because <laughs> we, <laughs> <laughs> we need the help. Um, all right. You ready to get into McKenzie's personal yeah. statement? Let's do it. Last year, I spent a semester studying abroad in Seville, Spain. We always have to pause, don't we, Ben? and just think about the first sentence. Most important sentence. To me, that falls a little flat. The verb is spent. Thankfully, yeah. Mackenzie says I, so it's an I sentence. We're gonna learn yeah. something about you, Mackenzie. Uh, but Very passive the, though. <laughs> it's like, yeah, spending I the summer. breathed air and ate food and drank water, you know, in Seville, Spain. Like it's just a, I was there kind of a thing. Well, the funny thing here is without adding any content, we could cut spent a semester and just said, I studied abroad. And right. that alone would be, it's still like flat, but it's at least you yeah. doing something that's in, mildly impressive as opposed to just the, spending your time. Well, the sentence also, she mentions year and semester, right? So this is one mm -hmm. of those examples where editor me can mm -hmm. go through and take out half the words in mm -hmm. literally five seconds. It's like, instead yeah. of last year, I spent a semester studying abroad in Seville, Spain. Last semester, or just leave it no. as last year. Yeah. I studied abroad in Seville, Spain. It doesn't, if we don't need to know give, that it was last year. We don't need to and know, we don't need to know yeah. that it was a semester. We assume yeah. that it was recent. We assume that it was probably not. A, <laughs> I mean, just, I don't know. That's, that's half the words and it says the exact same thing and we get to, but I mean, really is I studied abroad in Seville is your best. That's your that's best what you foot want. forward. Yeah. I mean, what, what conclusions, Ben, what conclusions do you draw about someone? These are going to be unfair conclusions because you don't really know, but naturally we start making inferences, right? We have hypotheses. Yeah, if what you say you study, would you say? Yeah, yeah, I would say that you're wealthy and you had the opportunity to leave the country. Right. It's like I'm rich, so I went to Spain. Now that's you know I, I told you in advance that that was not going to be fair, but that's the type of thing that a complete stranger who doesn't know you like that's what that's what you've just told them, whether it's true or not. You could be on your own dime. You know, you could be like a super adventurer who is breaking out of the mold of the poverty you came from. Nine times out of 10, you're a rich kid who had this privilege. So, and then that's just not, I don't know. That's, I don't think that's anybody's best foot forward. Well, this next sentence doubles, it bad? doubles it? down on that rich and it's kid. A, and it's a bad Chris. sentence. Yeah. This being like, don't, you just what where are we going with this yeah this being the second time that i had studied in a spanish-speaking country 
I wanted to branch out of the classroom and get more involved in the community. It's a nice sentiment, I think. Well, the thing about all I wanted sentences is you can always just say what you ended up doing. I did. And we know that you wanted to do it and we see that you did it. So this whole thing can go if you did it. I began attending a church and through this, you, you could cut the and through this, I began yep. attending a church and discovered that they were in need of volunteers at their food bank. Okay. I, I will say um, it seems as if Mackenzie has been listening, right? We have a, I studied, I learned, I discovered, I began attending. It's like, it's at least like I sentences with here's what I was doing. You know, it's funny too. When we edit these, um, we're trying to get people to get into I sentences. Um, and then we're trying to get those sentences to focus on things that are meaningful, show them doing stuff that illustrates characteristics that law schools want. But one thing too is it's funny how a small word change even if you keep the same fundamental sentence can change the feeling of the sentence. So for example, if I were to keep this, if I were to say, Hey, yeah, I want to talk about this church stuff. Instead of saying I began attending a church, I would actually edit it to say, I found a church to uh, put the, the person back into the driver's seat, right? Like I proactively, I went out, I found a church. I, I started attending da, 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 as opposed to I began it. It just seems it's yeah. passive again. We, we keep running into this, yeah. like life is happening at me. I, I would agree with that edit. If we were going to keep that bit, I would also mm -hmm. just prefer that she started later in the story. I mean, mm -hmm. the first sentence, she could just be working at the food bank. hundred percent. I found this... a food bank that needed help. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The food bank you know, when I volunteered at a food bank in Seville, Spain, mm -hmm. here's what happened. It's like, let's get to that point. I don't need yep. the part where you went to the airport and got on a 747 <laughs> and flew to, you know, like we yeah. don't, we don't need all of this build up to it. You tell me about the food bank. I'd love to hear what you did at the food bank. Okay. Yep. I inquired about more information. Yeah. What did that make my nose? I, that, I asked, it's, I asked. <laughs> even well, then, like, why? Yeah, inquired is too fancy there. And also, you inquired about more information. It, about more information is super wordy right. and vague. And Asked for what? What do you want to yeah, know? Yeah, what's going on? Right, okay. And started spending a couple nights a week at their downtown location. Again, let's get to the let's get to the action part. We yeah. I want to see you at night in downtown working at the food bank. Yep. I helped sort and distribute the donations we received from grocery stores and farmers. On a few occasions, they asked me to entertain the people who were waiting to receive their food baskets by hosting English classes. You know what? That's actually kind of neat. I like that. I taught English classes at a food bank, you know? Yeah. Like, but we got to, you can't get there in eight sentences. You have to get there in like one sentence. Imagine if your personal statement started out like this, I'm not saying this is what it should be, but given what we've read so far, what if it said something like, when I volunteered at a food bank in Seville, Spain, I was asked to entertain the people who are waiting to receive their food baskets. Even better, classes. even better, spin it into there was a problem and you solved it. So mm -hmm. instead of the, they asked me to do this, mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. even have to say that you were the one who came up with the idea. You can let the reader incorrectly infer that you were the one that came up with the idea. It wouldn't be a lie at all. You would just say, describe the problem of these people sitting there waiting to get their food baskets and then describe how you chose topics such as whatever, whatever, right? Cause she goes on and she says, 
I would choose a topic, which she should have said, I chose topics, but I would choose a topic such as restaurants or public transport and create a lesson using all the terms that would be useful to know in an English speaking country. So she has the opportunity here to have a problem and a solution. Yep. Right. There's a problem and she's the solution. Well, and I might even, I mean, the solution that you suggested that she solved was entertaining them, but you could, you could actually just move right to the problem that she actually is trying to solve right now. And that is using these terms in English speaking countries, like helping them learn English, which sounds like a bigger problem than entertaining them in mind. Not saying that you don't talk about that, but we could focus on that. Yeah. You taught English to poor people in Seville, Spain. Yeah. They were actually at a food bank waiting to get food. You were volunteering at night downtown makes you sound like kind of a badass. And it also makes you sound really human and helpful and I don't know, brave and interesting in a lot of ways, actually. Yeah. To be, to be sitting there teaching these poor people English. Um, and you know, we've cool. totally, know. we've totally avoided the whole, Oh, I'm a rich kid persona if you just jump into i did this in spain as opposed to i was studying abroad in spain right. and then did this yeah it's total semester different abroad, focus i don't i don't think we need to say those words I, I, you're you are in spain for whatever reason don't yep yeah um sometimes people would find me afterward to ask questions about english or myself through these conversations, I was surprised to find that nearly all of the attendees were actually Latin American or Middle Eastern immigrants rather than Spaniards. Due to the period of time that I was in Spain, many were refugees from Venezuela who were sending money to help their families back home. That's a garbage construction there. I mean, you make it sound as if these refugees from Venezuela are caused by you, right? Due yeah, to some, the period How of long time. you were there. <laughs> right. I was in there so long that Venezuela sent refugees to Spain. Like, no, that's not, that's not what happened. So shorter sentences, more declarative, cut out that due to the period of time. That's just totally gone. Um, okay, so... You're teaching Venezuelan refugees English in Spain. Cool. What do you mean that's not impressive? I mean, she thinks that that's like not impressive. I think that's totally impressive. I think it's impressive. I don't, by the way, regarding these last two sentences, I'm not totally sure why the sentences are focusing on that you learned this. I think I would <laughs> right. state it if it's important to your story. Right. It, it always makes you look naive when you say, I was surprised to find whatever. I mean, the reader can be surprised. You can just tell us the facts. We don't, yep. we don't, yeah, we don't need the extra editorialization about you learning this fact. Like we can learn it. Just tell us. Mm -hmm. All right. That's the first paragraph. A um, lot of words there, not enough content. Um, too much buildup, too much background. There's really kind of like one useful fact there. She could have gone deeper right into an example of one of these interactions or, you know, one night that she was there, maybe one, per one class that went particularly well, or I don't know, something funny or something interesting happened. Um, yeah, you could, you could turn this into gold. If you yeah. shortened it down to three to five sentences, one or two of them is quickly getting into you volunteering and teaching English and making these decisions. A couple more about a specific well, person you were helping. Exactly. All of a sudden we're like, wow, okay, you're doing shit. You're doing it overseas. You're helping people solve problems. We love you. Right. And right now it's kind right. of like, oh, I'm like lost in the weeds. Well, it would be show it would be showing because right now it's kind of telling. Mm-hmm. It would be showing instead of telling when she says sometimes people would find me afterward to ask questions. 
you're kind of just telling me that that happened, that, that that happened. When did it happen? Oh, it happened sometimes. Mm -hmm. All right. Why don't you just tell me about one of these interactions and then I can infer that it happened sometimes. Sometimes means once or more. So if you just tell me about Maria, who you met from Venezuela, who was sending mm -hmm. money back home because she was a refugee, you know, then now you're teaching this real human person, Maria, you're teaching her English in Spain. She's a refugee from Venezuela. It's pretty cool. Yep. You got to get into the more specific. Everybody tries to go way too broad instead of just go like detail into one um, person. Anyway. <laughs> Again, upon returning from that semester abroad. Yeah, we're reminded of this privilege. Right. I began a managerial internship with Bluegrass Hospitality Group, BHG, a prominent hospitality organization in Kentucky. And again, we get a pretty common mistake. I, I guess I got to go back and look at McKenzie saying, at least I'm not making the most obvious mistakes. Well, <laughs> Mackenzie, one of the things that we said repeatedly during that personal statement workshop, almost every person was telling us about interviewing, like applying for things, interviewing for things, getting job offers. Well, beginning an internship is exactly like, <laughs> What happened at the internship? Yep. You don't need to say you began the internship. We get it. Also, the location of the internship, the name of the company. People say this all the time. We were working on a personal statement, right? Like a month ago about someone working at a law firm and they dropped the name of the law firm. No one gives a shit. Yeah. Like, okay, we get it. You were working at a law firm. I don't care which one. And I don't care which hospitality organization. And in some cases, I don't even care that it's a hospitality organization. What did you do? What was the problem that you solved? It's on your resume, the name of it, if we care. We definitely don't care. Yeah, I agree. Okay. For the first two weeks of the internship, I worked in the kitchen of one of BHG's restaurants. I encountered a strikingly similar situation to my volunteer experience in Spain. The vast majority of the kitchen workers were Hispanic immigrants, many of whom spoke little English. Using my Spanish skills, I learned that most had also migrated to the U.S. to flee adverse circumstances and send money back to their families. Mm, strikes me as a little bit obvious. I don't know. Um, people who work in kitchens, Ben, tend to be among our least fortunate. They tend to frequently be migrants and they frequently tend to be sending money back home. Um, well, so far, this is about what she's learned as opposed to what she's done. So. Right. What'd you do about it? Okay. Yeah. While the phenomenon of migrating for these reasons isn't a foreign concept to me, but your reader goes, well, it kind of seems like it is because you're telling me about how you learned this twice. It is a thing that people learn. I mean, it's not a foreign concept to you anymore, but it seems like it kind of was but anyway it was the first time i had developed close relationships with people who had been through this experience throughout my time with bhg i had many conversations with my friends in the kitchen and learned there it is again learned how problems with the u.s immigration system impact the lives of so many people i care about okay again this is an example of telling while the phenomenon, blah, blah, blah. It was the first time I had developed close relationships with people who had been through this experience. Instead of telling us that you developed close relationships, tell us about a relationship that you developed. Again, not doesn't have to be Maria, but whoever it was that you <laughs> talked to, even then, I don't know if this is the right subject matter. It's not like the right gonna, topic. 
I it's, don't. It's about give, someone else. I don't give a shit about the origin story of your progressive leanings. Yeah, most that's really people. What this is. Most people applying to law school, uh, like, have these. Uh, I mean, I think that's fair to say. It seems, sure seems like it to me. I mean, we do have some like conservative um, kids in our classes sometimes, but most of these, you know, they're young, they are politically progressive, they think they're going to make a difference in the world. So they want to go to law school so that they can help immigrants. Okay. That's like probably 20% of all law school applicants think that they're going to solve the world's refugee problems. All right. Um, you, maybe you will, but the origin story of how you came to care about these issues, it does not differentiate you in not the slightest from all other applicants. Like you met a poor person, you felt sorry for them. So you decided to go to law school. Great. I, I'm not interested in, I, I just, there's too many of those stories. That's why I'm not interested. Like, you know what the thing is? Because Mackenzie's mentioning Kentucky, you know, it's just like now I'm seeing her as this like suburban, maybe rural, maybe suburban, mm -hmm. not super worldly, but has some privilege, went to college, did semesters abroad multiple times, traveled around. She is working. I mean, she's working but it's a managerial internship. It's not like she's in the kitchen. You know, <laughs> she, I don't, she doesn't think she's a dishwasher. She's a college kid, managerial intern, you know? Yeah. But she is having her eyes opened to the world by these experiences, which is a thing that happens when you're young and when you travel. I went through that myself. I'm sure you went through that as well, Ben. You, you, you learn things from travel. That's great. Yeah. But it's just not special. It's just like you and every other applicant, you all have that exact same story. Yeah. You know, or it's, or it's a different version of that story where it's actually your family. It's somebody that you went, you met them in elementary school, whatever. It's still just someone else's problem and you haven't solved it. You're just inspired by it somehow. And so you want to go to law school. It's not a unique, special thing. It's not you actually doing anything. So I would much rather talk about projects you worked on, a thing you did. And we're I'd at the be end okay. of the- Oh yeah, go ahead. Well, I was thinking in terms of projects or things that she did, I, I would be okay with a statement that focuses more on the choices she made to help these people learn English in, in Spain. And then maybe hopefully she did this too in Kentucky. That would be kind of cool. She did, and then I had this other job and I did the same thing again, not focusing on the job, but focusing on what she did to help these people. And then you're like, wow, you really care about these folks and you're really trying to help them. This is what you're doing as opposed to her saying, this is what I learned. And this is, I care about this. We just get that. I think we got way too much on the, um, superhero movies these days i mean i'm just over i think i've talked to you about this before on the show i'm basically over like the avengers and everything i just don't it's too much there's too many of them right some of them mm -hmm. are great some it's, mm -hmm. a lot of it is boring frankly but um maybe like people are so tuned in to this origin story um theme mm. that they think that they're writing a personal statement that's like oh wow this is the origin story of Mackenzie, the super lawyer, the super immigration lawyer. Look how she got inspired by these experiences, right? Yeah, yeah. And the, the problem is that these origin stories all sound exactly the same. And no one gives a shit about the superhero origin story until we see some superhero shit. <laughs> right yeah. like and, yeah. and so far all we've got is the background like kind of boring it's very fairly mundane like oh i met poor people guess what they're refugees they send money back home that's a problem that's an issue but you're not solving it yet so all you're telling me like you're telling me about someone else's problem so it's plight of the downtrodden and it's also just this like wannabe origin story 
I think you can cut almost all of these first two paragraphs. Um, Cause if you haven't done anything about it yet, then we don't, we don't care really. Um, last paragraph. When I began my senior year, I chose to create an episode for our town's Spanish speaking radio station for my senior year, uh, sorry, for my senior capstone project. How do you feel now, Ben? I feel better. This is proactive. <laughs> yeah, this is so much better. She should, she should start here, right? Cut everything else. You might mention it as a, an aside or something, but we don't need two thirds of your statement to be all about you meeting Spanish speaking refugees. Mm -hmm. We need to hear what you did after that. What'd you do about it? And so now this, and yeah, it's a senior project, but Hey, Mackenzie is very young. It's okay for her to write about something she did in her senior year of college, especially if it's something that actually went out into the real world. And Mackenzie, you would easily be able to come up with two full pages. You could make your entire personal statement about this one project and make yourself look like a badass. In the episode, dude, she produced a radio show. That's an accomplishment. It is. In the episode, I provided resources to recent immigrants looking to obtain legal status in the United States, discussed workers' rights, and shared advice from an immigrant who now runs a successful business. I also interviewed two immigration attorneys and the outreach coordinator for the Kentucky Equal Justice Center. My episode was aired on the radio station and posted on their website, from which I could share it with my friends. <laughs> Cut out after website, period. Yeah. We get it. We don't, <laughs> we don't want to focus on this small group good of people. good for sharing. Who, yeah. yeah. I copied and pasted them a link and I put it into <laughs> an email and hit send. From that, they were able to click on the link, go to the website and listen to the episode. No, <laughs> we don't need any of that stuff. We get it. It went on the air. It was on their website. Cool. While I still have so much to learn, being more educated on this topic has allowed me to speak out for the U.S. immigrant population when false information is spread. Wait, 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 wait. What happened? This is like, no, I'm a superhero, but we not. don't. <laughs> no. This is you arguing with Trumpers. I don't need to hear about you arguing with Trumpers. Like, that's you're Where not is even happening is this on no. facebook <laughs> you're not out i don't want to hear about you out there trying to debunk false information unless you have specifics like do you work for snopes like are you actually out there actively doing a anti-disinformation campaign i don't talk about like be more plain spoken. Don't make such grandiose conclusions. Talk about the actual radio show. Just t give me a page and a half on this project. I would love to read it. Really. Why did you choose these attorneys? What did um, you do to prepare questions for them? How did you How get did them you to decide on those questions? You? Yeah. Was it hard? Did you cold call them? Did you cold email them? Did you have to follow up? Was it difficult to get the scheduling? How did you produce it? Did you do it on Skype? Did you do it in person or did you do it on Zoom? I don't know why Skype or Skype come. What resources did you decide to share with uh, recent immigrants? Why those resources? This, this is a lot of work you had to do. You can't just throw together an episode and have it yeah, work. Weirdly making grandiose claims about things I don't believe, like speak out for the U.S. immigrant population when false information is spread. I mean, there's more false information than ever, right? So it's like, yeah. you, you haven't solved that problem. So, I, you know, um, don't make that claim. And, and instead, just go into much more detail about this awesome project you did. It's fantastic. 
Last sentence, a career in law will give me the opportunity to help and support this group of people in an even more tangible way. Just, you could basically cut that out. Yeah. Um, as always, there is like a kernel, a little golden nugget inside the statement. I think it's this, the anecdote, you can flesh out the whole production of this show and I would actually have no problem with a very short introduction that started with her uh, teaching English in Spain. It could show why she chose this project, but also if she sticks to the facts, kind of put this human side to her, like, oh, okay, we could learn things from that. I would be okay with that. And it might yeah. round out the statement. Yeah. While volunteering at a, down t at a food bank in downtown Seville, Spain at night, I mean, obviously, don't make it so clunky, but those are some details <laughs> that are that are useful, right? Yeah, I um, taught English. You know, I, I would teach. Uh, yeah, I taught English to Venezuelan refugees who were in Seville for work, sending money back home, waiting to get their food at the food bank. Yeah. Yep. When I returned, you know, for my senior year at mm -hmm. whatever I chose as my senior capstone project to create an episode for our town's Spanish speaking radio station. And then you can just go all into the, how it, how it all went down. And it would make so much sense. And you'd be like, Oh wow, you're this person who did this and now you're doing this. You're a problem solver. Not this, yep. all this learning stuff, not these relationships I created and yeah. Don't care what you learned. Don't care what you think or thought. I care less about what you want to do or what you think you're going to do than what you have actually done. You know, if you, if you show me, so I think we've got two really good ideas here. Mm -hmm. Two sentences, background about the food bank, English classes, right into here's what I did about it. I yeah. created this senior capstone project. I would like McKinsey to write like four pages about this senior capstone project and then cut out and yeah. then cut it down to a page and a half. Yeah. Because I guarantee as on route to doing this shit, she like, she, I'm sure she had to like learn things about, not that I really want to know that much about learning, but she had to do things in radio production that she had never done before. I'm sure she did editing, she did interviewing, she did producing to set up the interviews in the first place. She did, so there's lots of little mini victories that are built into this one larger victory of producing this show and getting it actually on the air. There's also opportunities to drop facts about the world into those actions that then reveal what she knows about this issue without her coming out and saying, I learned X. Like you could say, I interviewed so-and-so about X, Y, Z because of its impact on this community or something yeah. like that. And you're like, oh, well, you apparently know this shit now. Right. I don't need learned how problems with the U.S. immigration system impact the lives of so many people I care about. Instead, you could just tell me about one person that you interviewed for this show. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I get it. She's been around the block. And you don't need to tell me a career in law will give me the opportunity to help and support, by the way, I don't know if you got that, Ben, <laughs> help and support yeah. this group of people in an even more tangible way. Like, I get it that you want to help and support these people. But you didn't need to tell me that. You could have just showed me that by showing me the help you've already been giving them. Yeah. <laughs> like you, you're volunteering at a fucking food bank teaching English to these poor people. And then you're creating a radio episode to help these poor people. You don't need to say you want to help these people. You're doing it already. So just tell me about the doing it. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm also... Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, a lot of these are just getting into the details of how you craft these sentences once you get this content that Nathan is talking about, once you get those four pages. I'm wondering if I'd even want to pare down the sentences to a point where I'm saying things like, when I began, I don't even know if I'd say when it was, but 
after I got back, I created an episode for our town's Spanish speaking radio station. You don't need to tell them you did it for your senior capstone project. That might be on your resume right. anyways, but let's just make it like I did yep. this stuff. And it's like, okay, fuck. Now, it, you, right. When you say it's part of your senior capstone project, it's kind of emphasizing that you had to do this for school. And like, you probably had guidance from the school. I don't want you to lie and pretend that that's not true, but why talk about it? Yeah. I produced a radio show. Immediately the 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 reader is like, "Oh wow. I want I mean, there are a million applications to law. Lawyers love going on the radio. Lawyer, mm -hmm. Lawyers like it's one of the best marketing tools many lawyers have is a radio show. So they start seeing you as like, "Oh shit. Wow, a hustler. She can go out and get things done." There's a million different applications to the law. Every, everywhere really but it, so all you have to do is just talk about you being successful in doing almost anything doing is the key right yeah not learning not thinking not feeling not wanting to do rather just the doing part so she's got plenty of stuff everybody has plenty of stuff to talk about but you got to get out of the the broad conclusory stuff and get into the more like, well, this is what actually happened. This is what I did. I do think your point is good, Ben, about leaving out the senior capstone project. Makes it sound like she was forced to do it. Oh, you had to pick from a list. Oh, the radio station already was set up with the school to have yeah. you do this as a project, right? Which may or may not be true, but the reader infers that it might be true when you say that it was a senior capstone project. And mm -hmm. if you didn't say that, it's just like, oh, shit, she produced a radio show. Wow. That's amazing. Can I hear yeah. it? Is it, on the, is it on your resume? By the way, it should be on your resume. That's a publication that should be, I would think, on your resume. Yeah. Okay. Want to wrap it up there? Let's do it. Thanks, Mackenzie, um, by the way, for writing in. Brave. Yeah, thank you. Brave, but I hope helpful. I hope people go home with this advice and implement it. I wonder what happens. We don't usually hear back from <laughs> people that we get to know on a very sometimes intimate level. It's like, we've just gone through a lot of your life. I hope that it's helpful. Anyways, um, join the Thinking LSAT podcast group on Facebook. Like our pages at LSAT Demon L and at Thinking LSAT. That's on Facebook. Follow us at Thinking LSAT and at LSAT Demon on Instagram. We're also at Thinking LSAT on Twitter and Nathan is on Twitter at NFox. That's where he was popping off about LSAC's glorious rollout of the Flex yet again. Uh, we're on YouTube as well. So we'll start including those videos in the newsletter, by the way, which you can sign up for at thinkinglset.com. It lays out the show so you can find exactly where things are talked about. Um, and of course, our joint project is lsatdemon.com. Leave us a review on iTunes if you're so inclined. That was episode 262 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.